I got a word for us tonight. This could be teach, it could be preach, it'll be, it'll be whatever God wants it to be. Uh, and it'll be whatever you choose for it to be. Because really it is up to you uh, how you receive it. And so tonight I want to talk to us. And I was thinking about just some, uh, some slang words just the other day. And, and I'm going to read a scripture in a minute. In fact, let's just read it. Let's just read the scripture right now. The book of Matthew, the fifth chapter, the 13th verse. Matthew 5 and 13. It says, you are the salt of the earth. You, you are the salt of the earth. Now, let's stop right there. And I begin to think about salt. And, and have you ever heard people say something like, man, they're just salty. And, and I wasn't, I kind of thought I knew what it meant, but I thought, well, I'm going to Google it because I want to make sure that I don't get up there. And, and because, you know, some of the language and stuff they use nowadays, as I've gotten older, I'm really not sure what they mean. And so I wanted to make sure and not say anything inappropriate. And, and, uh, and so I kind of looked it up, and it, it just basically is what I thought it was, somebody that's expressing themselves in a resentful, uh, bitter way, somebody that's just hateful, somebody that's just, uh, they're, they're sensitive, they're angry, they're just salty. I mean, they're, have you ever been around those folks? Have you ever, are you married to them? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> let's not do that. Let's, let's not go there. <laughs> but tonight, out of the book of Matthew, we're not talking about that kind of salty when he's telling us this. He, he, Jesus is teaching, and, and so we're not, we're not looking at it from that matter. But let's go on and read it. said, you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. And so this setting that we are reading from actually takes place. Uh, Jesus has been in Galilee, and he went up to the side of this mountain on the northwest side, uh, and he calls his disciples up, and he said, I, I want to I teach you some things. He's, he's been, if you read before, he's been... He has been healing the sick. People have been coming to him. Lives have been radically changed. The crowd's following him. And so that is the setting. Jesus has pulled the disciples up, and, and they're listening. And he, this is where he talks about the Sermon on the Mount. And so Jesus is the teacher. And if you're reading this, he is the teacher. We are the audience. We are the audience. We're listening to what he says. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all of them, but if you read previous to this happening, you're going to find what is called the Beatitudes. Most of you know what the Beatitudes are, and, and, and it's the ones, you know, it's, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They will be filled. And it goes on and on. And, and, and so I was reading this, but it made me think about an article that I read. It's been a while back. I was reading an article about typos that were in the Bible. Some of the things, they caught them, thank goodness, before they put them out on the shelves and they corrected them. But I want to read you some of the, the typos that were, uh, that were discovered. And, and again, they caught it in different translations. They caught it before they put out one, Bi one Bible read this. Thou shalt commit adultery. That's not cool. Another one reads, know ye not that the unrighteous shall inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, we, we're looking at these stuff. How about this one? Go and sin on more. <clears throat> one of the Beatitudes that I want to talk about tonight, it's found in verse 9, and it says this. It says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called the children of God. And so in this, there was another typo in in. Uh, this scripture, and, and instead of saying blessed are the peacemakers, uh, and I want to talk to you on this thought tonight, on this typo, blessed are the placemakers. 
Blessed are the placemakers. This was a typo. This was one of the typos that actually made sense. As I began to look through it, and I thought, wow, that, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to preach on the other ones. I mean, you couldn't make a message on those, but, but this typo, I thought, you know what? I can hang with that typo. That, that one will kind of work. And, and so, again, for me, I began to look through the Beatitudes. Have you ever just read the Beatitudes? Have you ever just looked at them? I mean, to me, they're kind of full of typos. Even when they're right, it's like they're full of typos. It's just, I mean, we read through them. Blessed are the meek. I, I don't, I doubt that. I mean, blessed, okay, here's another, what's up with the one that says, blessed are the poor in spirit? Are, are they serious? It seems like it would be, blessed are the rich in spirit, right? right? And, and, and so, as I was looking through that, I thought, man, that, that just really doesn't make sense. But then I got to thinking, I can't look, look at them through my eyes. Boys, don't be distracting me tonight. I can't look through my eyes. I have to look through the eyes of Jesus. I can't be looking through my eyes. I can't look through human eyes. I've got to look through the eyes of Jesus for them to make any sense to me at all. I can't look at them through my eyes. To look at these through his eyes, we got to first understand a couple things. These blessings known as the Beatitudes are not descriptions of human feelings. So it's not a description of human feeling. It's not a description of how we feel. When Jesus said, blessed is he, he is not saying happy is he. Oh, you're happy. No, he's not saying happy is he. There's more to these beatitudes than nine be happy attitudes. That's not what they are. It's not the happy beatitudes. Because to be blessed in this case, when he says blessed are these, to be blessed in these cases is to be privileged or fortunate. Or to be blessed is to be given the gift of divine favor. I don't know about you, but I want favor. I want the favor of God. The blessings of the Beatitudes, think about it, it really is not about us. It's not about how we feel. Instead, it's really about what God has done for us. It's not, well, I feel this way. No, it's about what he has done for us. And with that being said, we get a clear understanding of saying, hey, wait a minute, blessed are the placemakers. Blessed are they because of what he has done for us. Blessed are the placemakers. And, and again, I'm talking about the ones that make place in the kingdom of God for him. You got to make a place. I was thinking about this today and I was going over the notes and praying and as I always do, <clears throat> on Wednesdays especially, I do every day, but on Wednesdays I come in here, shut the lights off, and I begin to think about this. It's the calendar. If you get the calendar out and you look, there are already days that are already set aside in the calendar. You don't have to write down Christmas Day. It's already on there. You don't have to write down Martin Luther King's birthday. It's already on there. You don't have to write down the 4th of July. It's already on there. You, you see what I'm saying? Those are, you don't have to make a side note and say, oh, I need to remember that, that that's what that day. I was just thinking about that and I thought, wouldn't it be cool that if our calendars already said that on Sunday and Wednesday, you know what, that's God's day. It doesn't really matter. I mean, I know, don't leave and say every day's God. I know every day's God's day, but wouldn't it be cool if the calendar just said, oh, today I'm going into the house of the Lord. Wednesday, I'm going into the house of the Lord. We've already put it down. It doesn't matter what happens. I'm going to the house of the Lord. Yeah, but you got things going on. You know what? Sometimes we just got to say, hey, I'm going to seek him first and I'm going to the house of the Lord. And I know there's vacation and you get sick and I'm not saying that, but we need to make it a priority of going to God's house. And so think about it. Blessed are the placemakers, those who make place for God. It says, for they will be called, or blessed are the peacemakers, but we're saying placemakers in this, for they shall be called the children of God if you make a place for him. Now, that makes more sense to me. 
That, and you say, what do you mean? Because I don't know about you, but I don't always want to be a peacemaker. I can make a place for God, but I don't always want to be a peacemaker. I, I don't always want to be the one that has to be peaceful. I don't want to be that. And so that makes sense. But, but, but again, it still says that blessed are the peacemakers. We might find ourselves poor in spirit and say, what in the world? This describes a person who finds their true identity and their true strength is in the one true God. I can't make it without him. Some of y'all are trying to make it without him and that's why you're messing up. Because I can't make it without him. Whatever it is, I have to have God in my life. God has to be above and beyond everything else in my life. And so I have to be doing that. I have to, I have to be, okay, I'm poor in spirit because God, I totally depend on you. It's not a bad thing to be poor in spirit. It's not a bad thing for that. It just means that, you know what? We know that we are not the masters of the universe, that we are not over everything. It means that we are totally dependent on God. It said, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When you get to the point and you say, God, I'm totally dependent on you for everything, he said, that's what I'm looking for. And he said, that's where you get the kingdom of heaven. When we just say, God, I'm yours. Then it goes on, it says, those who mourn. Well, that means we say, well, does that mean we go around sad all the time? No. No, that means that you look around and you see the mess that the world is in. And you feel grieved about it. When you see all the pain, you see all the death, you see all of these things. And, and it's just, it's just kind of like we mourn because of all the evil around us. That's what it's talking about. And these are all kingdom-based qualities that can open the door to inner peace. If we will just grab them, it will open the door. Blessed are the placemakers. Blessed are those who make a place for God. And so Matthew in our text, Matthew 5, 13, said, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's, it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So, you are the salt of the earth. I am the salt of the earth. The prophets who went before, they were the salt of the land of Canaan, but that's not us. We're the salt of the whole earth. You're, you're the salt of the whole earth. We've got to go into the whole world, the Bible says, and preach the gospel. And so we are to be the salt of the earth. First of all, though, you need to be the salt of your family. And then you need to be the salt of your community. And then you need to be the salt of this area. And then you need to be the salt of Illinois. And then you need to be the salt. You see what I'm saying? So we have to be the salt. And let me just throw a few things out. It's not about us four no more. I've heard people before, you know, I just, I just like being a part of a little church. So that's not biblical. No, it's not biblical. Why? Because he wants us to grow. He wants us to reach people. And, and what happens so many times, we get in a mindset and, and we don't want people infringing on our little community. It's like, well, if we get too many, we can't do this. You know what? I want to get as many as God will call. I want to get as many. I want to reach everybody that we can. Well, we might not be able to do a Memorial Day picnic. I don't care if we ever do one. If we can reach people for the kingdom of God. Let me ask a question. How many of you like salt on your food? We're not taping it, so don't. <laughs> a lot of people's like, no, I ain't raising my hand. I, I, I like to have something. My wife, she'll fix food and I'll say, bring the salt. You know what her first thing is? Have you tasted it yet? I don't have to taste it. I know it's going to need salt. <laughs> and I just got blood work done and my sodium level's low. You tell me he won't do it? Huh? <laughs> I've seen his faithfulness. <laughs> Here's the thing about salt. Here, here's, again, about salt. You put salt on food, and it changes the taste of the food. 
I don't know. There's just some things. I, I don't want it if it doesn't have salt on it. it because it changes the flavor. It changes the taste. It's just different. Don't miss this. The food does not taste or to not, does not change the taste of the salt. Now, don't, it went like this. No, the salt changes the taste of the food. The food doesn't change the taste of the salt. Pure salt maintains its flavor. It doesn't matter. Our text says that we are the salt of the earth. So if you and I are really the salt of the earth, then we should change the world. The world shouldn't be changing us. It shouldn't be Israel. They mixed some stuff, some different ingredients, and exposed it to the elements, and the salt was filtered out, and it was used for coating pathways. That's where it came up with, oh, okay, you put it down and you walk on it. Because if salt has lost its flavor, then you might as well walk on it. Why? Because it's not any good for what it's intended for. What's up with this light salt? There's no light salt. I think my wife try and fake me out sometimes and put stuff in. <laughs> She'll pour it in a regular container, but you know what? <laughs> I've got the spirit of discernment, I can tell. <laughs> you <laughs> because here's the thing, if, if, if the salt no longer has the flavor, then it's no good for anything. You might as well just throw it away. You might as well get rid of it. Here's what happens so many times, and I'm talking to Christians tonight. So many times, Christians get so mixed up with other ingredients that they no longer have the power of salt. They, they get so mixed up. Maybe this is why some people live, live a less than victorious life because they've taken the salt, they are the salt, but they mixed it with all kinds of other things, and all of a sudden now, the salt doesn't do what the salt is supposed to do. People, they no longer feel purpose in their life. They, they, again, maybe it's been that they've diluted themselves down so much with the cares of this life and the cares of this world that they've lost sight of what they really were intended to do. The Bible's very clear. You and I are the salt of the earth. And I'm going to throw this statement. I've said it for years, and it's so true. There comes a time in life that you can no, no longer do what you want to do, but you need to do what you're meant to do. It's time that Christians, and again, I'm talking as a whole, I'm not talking just to you, I'm talking just to all of us, me included. It's time that we start doing what God wants us to do and stop playing the game like we want to play it. You say, well, I came to get what I did last Wednesday. This will help you. Romans 12, 1 through 2. It says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Say that with me, unto God. You don't present it to me. You present it to him. You're presenting your body unto God. Well, I want to, I want to be pleasing to the power. Don't please me, please him which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So when you and I became Christians and we made a decision to live for God, we became a new creature in Christ, or at least we should have. All things the Bible said have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So we might still be in the world, but the Bible says we don't, we, we don't have to be of the world. We don't have to act like the world does. In fact, we shouldn't act like the world does. Romans 15, 16 says that we are sanctified by the Holy Ghost. In other words, we are set apart by the Holy Ghost. You got, you got the Holy Ghost in you? You know what? You're set apart. You ought to be set apart. There ought to be something different. Now, some of you might not agree with me tonight. Some of you might, uh, uh, that's listening to it on YouTube that gets on there and listens, some might not agree with it, but you know what? You will not win the world becoming like the world. 
you will not win the world by looking like the world. S some things I saw, and I showed my wife one, <clears throat> and it really, really bothered me. At the Super Bowl time, I seen where some church has done some stupid stuff. I showed my wife a clip, and at halftime, they did a halftime show. And the, the pastor wears a uniform like a referee, and he comes in swinging on, I guess it's that Miley Cyrus song, Wrecking Ball. And they're playing all kinds of secular mu music, and this dude comes swinging in on a wrecking ball. I don't know about you, but I still believe that this is the sanctified. I think this is the sanctuary. They wanted to be relevant. I also heard my wife was telling me about one, that one of the pastors kicked the Bible like a football. Are you kidding me? You look at me and say, well, you're just an old man. No, I want to be honest with you. I think we ought to be different than the world. I'm not going to become like the world to win the world. I'm not going to do a bunch of stuff just so I can get a big crowd because I want to see people really fall in love with Jesus Christ, not fall in love with the show. Because here's the thing, just because we are a non-denominational church, sin is still sin. Come on, hear me. Sin is still sin. Sin is still sin. We shouldn't have to have sin pointed out to us. We ought to know what sin is. We ought to have an understanding. I mean, I got to be honest with you. Today's society, they shouldn't have to put on the wrapper, don't eat the wrapper. The way I look at it, don't, don't put it on there. And it, they eat enough wrappers, they're going to learn. Man, maybe I shouldn't eat the wrapper. I mean, come on. It, it, sin should, if we've been living for God, any, we, we shouldn't have to have it. Part. Now, don't do that. That's a sin. Don't do that. That's a sin. Don't do that. Again, I don't think they ought to have to put a warning. I think we ought to get in the Word of God. And if you have the Holy Ghost living in you, then all of a sudden it's going to speak to you and say, no, don't do that. Stealing, still sin. Adultery is still sin. Premarital sex is still sin. Lying is still sin. And yes, even lack of faithfulness is still sin. If it was sin 100 years ago, guess what? It's still sin today. Are we okay? Because here's the thing, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings tonight. I, that is not my intention. I'm trying to help you make it to heaven. See, that's my job. I want to help you make it to heaven. I want to, I want to make it. And people will say, Pastor, you know what? Don't worry about it. I still love Jesus. I'm, I'm going to just keep doing what I want. Don't worry about it. I'm going to make it to heaven. Everything's fine. You know what? I pray that you do make it. I really pray that you do make it. But you know what? Nonetheless, God's word is still true. Sin will not enter in. That's what the book says. It's real simple. This is real simple. If it's not moving you closer to God, it could be sin or it could be leading to sin. And I'm going to use this. I've never done it, nor never will I do it. But I'm going to just throw this as an example. I could go out to lunch with a lady and that's not sin. In and of itself, it's not sin. We're just going to a public restaurant. We're just sitting across from one another, and we're just talking business. But you know what? It's what it could lead to. H hear me, because here, I'm a guy that's opened doors in my past. That's not been one of them. And once you open a door, it's hard to ever keep it closed. Oh, it's not going to hurt me. It might not starting out. But you know what? If it's not leading you closer to God, then you need to rethink it. You need to say, man, I don't know. I probably shouldn't be involved in it. 1 Corinthians 6 and 12, Paul says this, and I love it. He said, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So here's the thing. Some things might not be sin, 
But you know what we have to ask ourselves? Are they beneficial for me? Are, are they beneficial? Is living my life for Christ, are they beneficial for me? Something, something I don't understand, maybe you can help me tonight. I don't understand people that every time the world comes up with a new look or a new idea, they want to try it. I don't, I'm not talking about keeping up with fashion. As you all know, you can tell I'm a fashion guru. Yeah, and see, sound booth is even cheering me on. Now, I'm talking about things really most people don't do, but it seems to be the end, the end thing. And so a lot of folks run out and do it. They run out and do it. And I, I don't, again, uh, here's the question I guess I have, to, I, I have to ask. Are we trying to keep up with the fashion or are we trying to fit in with the world? What, can I just get on a soapbox just for a minute? I normally won't do this. I, and, and, and you might love it, and that's fine, and it's not sin. There's nothing bad wrong with it. I don't, I don't understand. I watch some of these pastors on TV, and on a Sunday, and they get up there, and all their jeans are all ripped out. And they're trying to be cool. Because, look, I'm wearing ripped jeans. I don't know. To me, that's just not cool. I don't know. I know. I'm an old man. I get it. If my jeans are ripped out, tell me because I don't know it. <laughs> Here, here's, here's my angle on this, and I'm not saying they are. Some of them are really good preachers. I just I don't understand some things, but here's what I know. We've got to stop trying to fit in with the world and fit the world in with Jesus Christ. So how can we do this? If we have lost our flavor, how can we do it? Because here's the thing, a teacher cannot teach if they become like the student. We're not going to reach the lost just because we look like them and act like them. I doubt if one person has given their life to Christ because the pastor had ripped out jeans. I'll tell you what, look at that. That just makes me think of Jesus. I'm giving my life to him. I just don't think that's the deal. I mean, if that floats your boat, I guess, but, but that's not it. The world isn't, we're not going to reach them. Because here's what I know. When the lost is de desperate, they're not looking for somebody or something just like they are. They're looking for something different. The only way that we will reach the lost is become more like Jesus. And if we become set apart, if we become sanctified and let them know, you know what, there's something different. There's something different inside of us. And let me add, not in a weird way. Y'all don't have to go out and be weird, okay? Christians, sometimes Christians can be weird. Y'all never been around them? I've been around some of them that's kind of weird. I'm married one. <laughs> I just you guys are way too tired. I had to lighten it up a little bit. But you don't have to act weird to be a Christian. But you know what? You can, you can share Christ in a godly way. And so I want you to ask, ask this question. When, whenever you're wondering, whenever you're thinking, you, you got to ask yourself this question. Would, would Jesus do this? Is this something he would do? Would, would Jesus act like I'm acting? Would he act this way? Would Jesus have the same attitude as me? Would, would he do that? Because here's what I know. If we're not careful, especially in the day and time we live in, we will become so close to the world, the world will dilute our flavor. The Bible tells us that he that knows to do right but doesn't, to him or her, it's sin. You're here and you know to do right and you're not doing it. It's sin. And so if you know that you, you, you're not doing right, if you have an understanding, don't let Satan deceive you into thinking that you're saved. 
okay, now we're going to really tighten things up. Come on up here, Israel. We're going to really tighten things up on this last page. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say it. I, I know it's not proper to say nowadays. I get it. Well, no, I don't get it. But I'm going to say it anyway. If you have sin in your life, continual sin, you're not saved. You're not saved. I'm not saying the minute you sin that you can't go to God. In fact, that's what you need to do. And there's God's grace and it's sufficient. And, and I'm not saying that we don't struggle with things and we have to call on the name of God and, and that we go and, and we repent and we do that. But you know what? If we're blatantly living in sin, then guess what? We aren't saved. You say, Pastor, I'm not sure it's sin. I really don't know. Well, here's an easy thing to think about. Are your actions, is your attitude benefiting your relationship with God? If it's not, get rid of it. Here's, here's something that some of us need to hear. Just because you think of it don't mean you have to get on Facebook and post it. You don't have to get on Car Carterville Connected under anonymous because guess what? The Holy Ghost still knows. Hebrews 12, the last part of verse 1, Paul said, let us throw off, and I did a series on this or a few weeks, several months back called Weight Watchers. Paul said, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And so I want us to stand tonight. Now, now is the time to lay it down. Now's the time just, because here's the thing, we're in a race. We're, we are in a race. We're in a race. And here's the thing about a race. How can we run the race like Jesus wants us to if we're so entangled with everything? I, I know, I get it. it I, I, get, I, I hear it all the time. It might cause us to have to change some things in life. I mean, God knows I've had to change things in my life, but what you have to do is you have to ask yourself, is heaven worth it? Is heaven worth it? Man, I've heard a lot of people call it the game of life. They say, man, how are you doing in the game of life? But I want to be honest with all of us, and we know if you've lived any length of time, you know. You know what? Life is not a game. You don't hit replay. It's not game, a game. It's for real. Life is for real. It's for keeps. And so I challenge all of us tonight, make a place in your life for Jesus. Not on the parameter, but in the center. Let your life revolve around him because that's where it really is. And remember this. Blessed are the placemakers. Blessed are the placemakers. Those that have made a place for God. And so right now, I want us to bow our heads, everybody in the place. And I just want to ask you this. Again, I'm not saying it, that you're not saved. I'm just saying, have you made a place for him? Or has some of the things kind of creeped up and started diluting some things and maybe the salt has lost its flavor just a little bit. So I challenge you tonight. 
Make him the sinner. Make him the sinner right now. Make him the sinner. Make him the sinner. We're going to sing this song. Want everybody to sing it with us? Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end. Take a moment, just you and him. It's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus at the center. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. It's always been you, Jesus. Sing it out, Jesus. Jesus. Sing it again, Jesus. And Jesus. Right now, Jesus, Lord, be the center of our life. Jesus. 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 Nothing else. Nothing else matters. Jesus, you're the center, and everything revolves around you, Jesus, you, Jesus at the center, and Jesus at the center of my life, sing it out, and Jesus at the center. It will always be, it's always been you, Jesus, all my life, Jesus, till I die, Jesus, until I walk into eternity, Jesus, nothing else matters, nothing. Jesus, you're the center, and everything revolves around you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, tonight, help us all to be placemakers. Help us all, Lord, to make a place for you, Lord, in the center of our lives, Lord, where Lord, our lives revolve around you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus. Lord, that we are able to come to you. And Lord, we're able to seek your face and we're able, Lord, to call on your name. And so, Lord, tonight, as we make you the center of our lives, help us to be the salt of the earth. Lord, help us to not lose flavor, but Lord, to be a light that is set up on a hill. And Lord, we thank you for that tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Let's go on and give him a little praise in the house right now.